All righty, Book of Ephesians, two major sections, chapters one through three, chapters four through six, chapters one through three, we're looking at who we are in Christ. So 29 times we are told that we are now in Christ by his grace and that God there, God the Father blesses us there. We saw seven spiritual blessings in the heavenly places that began uh, the book and kind of set the trajectory for everything that flows out of that. Um, the... Uh, the second half of the book, chapters four through six, how we live, um, they, uh, the author highlights for us five uh, different ways that we are to walk. And then finally, we're going to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. And uh, as we've been <clears throat> journeying through here, we've seen that we are going to walk worthily, which in that context is the highlighting unity. So we're walking in unity, chapter four, verses one through 16. Then uh, chapter 4, 17 through 32, we're walking in holiness. And uh, last time we finished up chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, walking in love. Which brings us up to chapter 5, verse 7 this morning, that we are going to walk in the light, followed by uh, the longest of the sections, that we are going to walk in wisdom, 515 down through 6-9. So... Who will read for us uh, chapter 5, verses 7 down through 14, uh, calling us to walk in light? Who can read that out loud for us, please? Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. All right. Thank you. Um, so this chapter five, verse seven, our first word is what? Therefore, Therefore which means there's a connection uh, between what he's about to say and what he has just said. So therefore, do not become partakers with them. The them is going to be in the context previous. Who's the them? Yeah, the sons of disobedience there in verse Six, those who are uh, idolatrous, giving themselves to immorality, impurity, covetousness, um, and the ones that we are to not be uh, imitating, because rather we are imita imitating God there in 5.1. Remember, we are walking in love, imitating God, imitating Christ, not giving into all of the ways that mark the sons of disobedience, because the wrath of God is coming upon them. So therefore... Do not be partakers with them. Um, then he tells you why. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. What does he mean by not become partaker or partners, uh, verse 7, with the sons of disobedience? What does, he, what does he mean to not be partners with them? Partners in sin. Partners in sin. Good. Yeah, so this is, is this calling you to not have unbelieving friends? Is this calling you to stay away altogether from unbelievers? You have another verse in the Bible that might highlight that? That proves that? That's not what he's saying? Well, you do have another verse. Does anybody know which one I'm thinking of? So this is not just which verse are you thinking of. This is what verse am I thinking of? Huh? Well, look at who's a prophet this morning. That's right. First Corinthians chapter 5, Can We're going to read First Corinthians 5, 10 for us. Uh, this is, um, well, actually, why don't you read 9, um, 9 through, yeah, 9 and 10. I wrote to you my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, or swindlers, or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. Just keep on reading. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed 
or as an idolater, or reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. But what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom, I, whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Well, that's a lot there, isn't it? Um, but in verse 10 in particular, notice there, he says, I'm not at all meaning the sexual immoral and, and everything else here uh, of, of the world. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. He says, of course, I'm not telling you to not be around unbelievers because then you'd need to go to Mars mm -hmm. um, because, well, there's unbelievers everywhere. So this is not at all saying don't have unbelieving friends. Um, the assumption is that you'll have unbelievers around you at your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, uh, in everything that you do. Rather here, this is a First Corinthians five. This is an exhortation for believers to um, yeah, uh, hold accountable those who say that they are Christians and um, yeah, in regards to, to fellowship with them. So let's go back to First Corinthians chapter five. Um, we're already there. Let's go back to Ephesians five. Uh, or otherwise we'll be in First Corinthians 5 all day. Um, but he says here, so do not become partners with them. So what he doesn't mean is normal life, having friends, being around unbelievers. But he does mean, as Karen said, partners with them in sin. So don't partner with them in their rebellion against the Lord. Don't partner with them when they indulge in wickedness. Unbelievers are going to do what unbelievers do. Just like many of us did before we were un, before we were believers. So it shouldn't surprise you when unbelievers act like unbelievers. It can grieve you. Um, now, it can also tempt you. So you have to be very mindful here that the exhortation is to not partner with them in the rebellion. So there's times you're like, you know what? I I think this is the party I got to step out of. God bless you guys. Have a great night. Uh, you know, I don't think that's the trip I can go on. Uh, thank you guys. appreciate it. But love y'all. I'm out. Um, I think this is, you know, I mean, like this is the conversation I'm going to have to bow out. So that, that kind of stuff there for the believer, there is a re requirement of courage to be able to lean upon the Lord for strength to retreat from rebellion. Um, yeah, and, and I think it takes a lot of wisdom and discernment to know yeah, what it looks like to have yeah, friendships with, 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 with unbelievers. I hope all of you have friends who are unbelievers. Uh, if not, please talk to me. I'd love to know what's going on. Um, so we, we should have friends with unbelievers, um, friendship with unbelievers, but um, you need to be very careful. Are they, um, are you, um, yeah, representing Jesus with them? Or are you partnering with, with them in rebellion against the very Jesus that you're supposed to be calling them to, to love, right? So do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness. This is your, uh, this is your life before following Jesus. Before your repentance, you were in darkness. This is what sin is. Sin is Darkness. I mean, from the very first sin, what did Adam and Eve do right away? They hid. They hid from the Lord. They, they ran from the light into the shadows of Eden. They hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. They covered themselves with uh, fig leaves to hide their sin. They're in the dark. That's what darkness is. This is why dark and light is often used in the Bible. Um, because light exposes things, right? It, it shows things for what they are, right? Well, here, um, he says, at one time you were darkness. And notice here, you just, you weren't just in the darkness, but you were darkness. You were actually part of the darkness, but rather now, now you are light in the Lord. So there's another in Christ, right? In the Lord, now you are light because you're united with Jesus his life is now being produced in you. His words become your words. His life becomes your life. His worship becomes your worship. His power becomes your power. To where now it's like, it's like a, a light bulb that gets screwed in. All of a sudden now, 
light comes out. Because of our union with Jesus, light comes out. That's why Jesus would say, you are the light of the world. He doesn't, hey, try to be the light of the world. He says, no, you, you are the light of the world. Uh, just as you are darkness, well, now you are light um, because of your union with him. So certainly we should cultivate that and shine a little brighter, but I think you understand the, the idea here. So, and then that's where the exhortation comes, of course, here in verse, uh, verse eight, walk as children of light. Again, this word that we've seen show up now in um, five or yeah, four, uh, four, one, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. 17, no longer walk as Gentiles, walk in love, five, uh, two, and now walk in light. Again, the word means to, to walk around, to live. It's a way of life. This is how you ought to be. You ought to be... Uh, walking as children of light. Now that children of light, if you're going to connect that with something that we saw previously in this, in this uh, chapter, where would you, what lines would you draw? Of God. Pardon? Of God. Yeah, so up there in, in 5.1, that we are beloved children, imitators of God, right? So walking of ch as children of the light, another name for, a child of light is a, yeah, a, a beloved child of God, a Christian, a believer, a disciple, a, yeah, a follower of Jesus, so all the same thing, right? So, and you would also maybe draw a line there to sons of disobedience, right? So that's going to be different. The sons of disobedience are going to be walking in darkness. So we want to go the opposite of that. Um, but yeah, walk as children of light. And then he tells you why here in verse 9. Um, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true so here he's he's clarifying for us the the illustration that he's using so um, what does he mean there in verse nine what, what does that mean we've gone over this before but what is help me understand the biblical metaphor of fruit it shows up here we see it in galatians 5 through the spirit jesus speaks about you know out of the good the good um a good tree produces good fruit. What is help me understand fruit as a metaphor in the Bible? Evidence of faith. Evidence of faith. Of faith. Okay, good. First, explain to explain it to me. What's fruit? Just when you think first, first thing of fruit, like pears and grapes and whatnot. Um, do you know pumpkins are fruit? Google that. Anyway, so uh, fruit, okay, um, not now, uh, but <laughs> so fruit, fruit is what? It's, it's evidence that this this root has, it's, it's alive, this plant's alive, this tree's alive, and the way you know is because it's giving fruit, right? And you know if it's a healthy tree because it's giving off healthy fruit, right? Well, it's, it's evidence of life. Well, in the same way, God uses that metaphor says, hey, everybody, just so you know, fruit and all that, you see it, yeah, sure, enjoy it for food, but it's also created to be a spiritual illustration for you. So every time you see fruit, you think, oh, I should be producing fruit. This fruit tastes good. The fruit that I'm putting off should be produce, producing life. And here the idea is the fruit of light, what this union with God by the Spirit in Christ Fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So everything that you do that is good for the glory of God, right for the glory of God, true for the glory of God, all of that, think, do, say, act, that is light. It's fruit of light. He says, walk that way. Walk in a way that's, that's not filled with all the works of darkness, but rather the, the fruit of light. And, um, and then he, he says here, verse, verse 10, really important. So if you just want to memorize a verse this week, this would be a great verse to memorize. Okay, it's short, which is really helpful. Super clear, very important. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. All right. Um, try, give effort, think about, 
meditate on what is pleasing to the Lord, which which means there certainly can be things that are what? Don't please. That, yeah, that are displeasing to him. So I think it's helpful for us to try to orient our thinking in everything. Every decision really is, does this please the Lord or does this not please the Lord? Paul says, if you're going to walk here according to the light, you need to enter every situation and discern. What's it mean to discern? Good. To, to evaluate, right? To measure, to sift through, right? Um, to do that with everything that you're watching, everything that you're listening to, every way that you're spending money, every bit of effort you're putting into relationships. So everything matters, right? Because everything is either pleasing or displeasing to the Lord. Um, this is one of the most, yeah, I think helpful, um, reorienting kind of things that has happened to me in the past number of years is begin to try to really frame obedience and disobedience alongside the idea of pleasing to the Lord and displeasing to the Lord. How could that potentially be helpful for us? That's how it's helped me is to not just see obedience as check marks or, you know, we talked about the religion of the box, you know, okay, I've read my Bible, I prayed, I tried to share the gospel with somebody, I, you know, gave some, you know, a biscuit to somebody who doesn't have food or whatever. Like you can, you can do the religion of the box and check off your box and it really not have much to do with God. Um, but when we orient everything around relationship, and see obedience actually as an act of worship, aiming to please the Lord. Um, not to earn his, not to earn our salvation. That's another religion. But it's already because we've been saved. Like this God who has shown us grace and mercy. That's why chapters one through three are already in place. So when you get a verse like this, you're not, you shouldn't be asking, does that mean you earn your salvation? Of course not. That's why I give you three chapters of, of course not. You are dead. God made you alive. You're already saved if you're in Christ. You're united with him. You're, this is talking about like because you're in a relationship with him now, be pleasing to him. This is about fellowship. This is about your, your communion with the one with whom you are not united, right? This is uh, talking about obedience. Yeah, so it's been super helpful for me. It's had to... It's, it's taken some work thinking about is this pleasing the Lord, displeasing the Lord, um, but that's it has been has been helpful. I'll pause there for a moment. See what kind of questions you have about verses seven down through ten so far, and then we'll. He's going to say some of the same things in eleven through through fourteen. But any questions, comments, insights. great it's good yeah so um there's lots of yeah cross references about light and darkness that can fill this this command out for you right so a lot of the teachings of of, of christ um, john chapter 8 um, you know a lot there um, as you mentioned matthew 8 and um, yeah so that that can help color it all the more yeah as you're going deeper stuff yep Okay.
Good. Yeah, it's great. So, yeah, Romans chapter 12, you want to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So your mind um, naturally is going to think in the ways of the world, which is um, yeah, rebellion against God, which is self-reliance, self-exaltation, self-serving, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you, our minds need to be renewed, right? So, so how then do we, if we're to try to discern what is pleasing the Lord, what are some things that are required for us to do? What, what should be part of the, the, the normal? Or what, are, yeah, what might fit into kind of categories to help us do this? Discern what is pleasing the Lord. What are, what are some of the things that we need to, to think about? Okay, we need to yield to the Spirit. Good. Yeah. Know, know what he says. Yeah, you got to know what he says so you can yield to the spirit. So if yield to the spirit is, I feel like God wants me to do this, that's dangerous. Um, if yield to the spirit is God's word said, this is what he wants me to do. And I'm going to trust him in this. That's safer, right? I'm not saying God can't subjectively move in situations, but what I'm saying, like the normal pattern for the Christian life is what does the Bible say? Um, and because that's how the spirit has told you what God wants you to do, right? So the, you got to know the word. You have to have your mind renewed to know what he, what he wants, what he's like, what he, what he likes, what he dislikes, what, what he commands, right? Um, what he calls us to engage in and to not engage in. So you got to, got to have the word, okay? Which is going to lead to obedience, we hope, right? Good. Anything else? Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Right, because you you could be, you could, you know, have, uh, so what Amy said was you need community, you need fellowship, right? You need other believers around you because they can see things you can't see. They're going to help you to be able to discern what is pleasing to the Lord because I don't know how life's been for you, but not everything's crystal clear. And there's so many things you're like, well, this or that. Um, and I need wisdom um, from, from the Lord. And we're looking in his word, but doing that in the context of community, right? And so, and again, a community of people who are walking by the spirit and who love the Lord as well, not just a bunch of yes people who, you know, wise counsel is not just seeking somebody who's going to tell you what you want to hear. Like, it's not wise counsel. Uh, so, okay, good. Anything else? What about desiring being discerning, having discernment? Okay, one more time. Desire having discernment, like uh, appreciating that. Okay, wanting the discernment, being indifferent. Great. So, yeah, I mean, the we read through Proverbs, the beginning of wisdom certainly is a fear to the Lord, but the beginning of the wisdom is even wanting wisdom, right? Which um, this is where I would say prayer fits in, and you ask God. God, help me to want what you want. Help me to not just know what you want, but help me to desire it. Change my heart. Change my affections. Change what I love, what I desire in your life. Only other thing that I thought of was here, your conscience. Um, yeah, your, your conscience being able, so you're, <clears throat> there are things that are going to be clearly okay for one believer to do that would be pleasing, that would be unpleasing to the Lord for a, a different believer to do, um, which is a, a kind of a strange thing, um, but it's yeah, part of reality. When you look at Romans chapter 14, the, the whole the whole chapter is about um, believers having differing consciences on um, non not commanded areas um, that uh, yeah, people have either freedom or lack thereof. And there needs to be, be wisdom and prayerfulness and um, yeah, thinking through what's, what's pleasing to the Lord or, or displeasing. But yeah. Um, Second Corinthians 5, 9 has a similar verse. It says, we make it our aim to please him. So our discerning what's pleasing to him. And then we make it our aim. This is our goal. You know, what do I do with my, what do I do with the money that he has given me? So even framing it that way, rather than what's, yeah, what do I do with my money? Well, 
It's not actually even your money. The, the earth is the Lord and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That means it's all from the Lord given to you as a steward. So you're actually stewarding his money. You're like, yeah, yeah, but, but I, I worked hard for that. Well, and then Deuteronomy say, well, who gave you the ability to work hard? Um, I said, the Lord did. So this is anything you have, the Lord has given you the ability to get. And we're to be stewards of it. Same with our, our bodies, um, our words, right? Anything that the Lord, seasons of life, um, these are all things that the Lord has entrusted to us to steward. Um, so I think if we see ourselves as stewards of God's stuff, um, including our bodies, that given for the purpose of, you know, as David said in the Psalms and supplied to Jesus in Hebrews, you know, you've given me a body to do your will. Like you're given a body to obey. So this is how, you, that just reframes how you think about everything. Um, is this Yeah, so I, I think this is one of the ways you work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God is working in you, right? So you, we are living out this reality of the fact that we have been saved and we are being saved and we are pressing on to inherit salvation, that we are to live this out and we are to discern what's pleasing the Lord. Part of, much of the work is already done for us. So what's God's will for your life? Well, you have tons of stuff in the Bible that's really clear what's God's will for your life. It's God's will for your life to tell the truth in this situation. It's God's will for your, your life, as you said, to not get drunk in this situation, right? Um, it's, it's God's will for you to, you know, ton, tons of things, share the gospel, like, and love people, forgive people, all that kind of stuff, not slander people. So, yes, part of discerning is seeing what's already been discerned for you. Like, there's tons of things that are crystal clear, and that is part of living out your, yeah, your, your salvation. So what you're asking. I think it's part of part of the practical part. So, so you use the example of being drunk, right? So, um, yeah, that's clearly not pleasing to the Lord. He's actually going to get to that here in a minute. Um, in Ephesians. So what becomes less clear is, is it pleasing for me right now before I go to bed to have a glass of wine? Is that pleasing to the Lord? Well, maybe. So, um, so first of all, some of you are convinced that you should just never drink a glass of alcohol for, for whatever reason. That's, that's something that you, you think I see in the Bible clearly that's not forbidden. But I also understand that for me, if I was to drink it, I think it would not be from faith, but it would be, it'd be sinful for me to do that because I'd be, I'd be sinning against my conscience. So then you should just never drink a glass of wine. Then there's others of you who, um, yeah, so for instance, maybe, maybe you're like, okay, I'm, um, I have freedom to, to drink a glass of wine, um, but is me drinking this glass of wine right now because I just, I'm going to yeah, be thankful for a gift from the Lord. And it's a, I enjoy the taste of it. And this is just a, a sweet enjoyment of, of a gift from the Lord. That's one thing versus man, I've had a hard day. I'm going to give me a glass of wine. I think that's going to take some more, some more discernment. Lord, am I running to this as a quick fix to kind of medicate myself a little bit rather than have I, have I actually spent any time in prayer? I've actually read some Psalms before I go to some Cabernet, you know? So I, I think that's where it might not be pleasing to the Lord. And you're like, well, can I have my glass of wine while I read the Psalms? Like, I, you know, talk to Jesus. I don't know. You know, I mean, but maybe. Uh, so so I, think it's, I think it comes back to why you're doing what you're doing. 
Now, of course, this is not intended to paralyze us and make us neurotic to where we're like, you know, class of wine, I can't live. I mean, you sit there for two hours trying to figure out what to do. That's not how God wants us to operate. I think this is a being aware. So there's seasons where it would be unwise for me to, to have glasses of wine because I can sense that I'm either doing it because I feel entitled to it because I've earned it because I've made it through a hard day or I'm doing it to medicate or I'm, yeah, for, for doing it to be cool and fit in or whatever, whatever it may be. And I just think that's, that's some hard work that's just going to take some prayerfulness and thoughtfulness and conversations with believers. And yeah, I think it's, it's part of walking with God. So does that make, is that more what you're talking about? Yeah. So that would be an, an example. There's 10,000 things that could fit into that. But yeah. Good question. Verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. So that goes back to not part, be partners with them, right? But instead expose them. So take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. So rebel against the rebellion. There's a rebellion going on. Don't engage in it, but rebel against the rebellion. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. So plants don't grow in the light. They grow in the, they, they do grow in the light. That's wrong. Google that. Um, so they, uh, plants grow in the light to produce light. But if you put it in the darkness, it's not going to, to give the kind of fruit that you're wanting, right? Um, here, he says there's, there's, yeah, unfruitful works of darkness. So it's not producing the kind of fruit that light produces. So don't take part in that. Don't take part in what is going to uh, quench the spirit and grieve the spirit and hinder him from producing um, fruit in your life, but rather expose them. So don't take part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. Well, what does that, what does that mean to expose them? Does that mean you should show up at work and just for as soon as you walk in, then like, oh, you're lying. Oh, you're, you know, you're in an affair. Oh, you're, like, and just go around and just expose everybody's sin like that. Is that, is that necessarily what he means here? No, you're to reflect the light through what you do and let that be different and thereby expose what you need to do. Good. So the, the baseline for what this means is that you are abstaining from evil. And by your abstaining from evil in actions and words, you are going to not be partakers with them, which will make you distinct. At times, that distinction is also going to involve you having conversations with people that does indeed call out sin. That's part of evangelism is saying, hey, let's let's talk about let's talk about what's going on in your world right now. Um, and have you ever thought about whether that's pleasing to God or not, um, and even framing lives of disobedience to pleasing the Lord. Um, yeah, and venturing in. So there's certainly times, if you're going to do evangelism, if you're going to share the gospel with somebody, you're going to talk about their sin. That's, that's part of it. So there is, in that sense, exposing. I think in this context, what he's highlighting is that you're to be dedicated to a life that's always seeking to please God, which is going to stand out among others who are not trying to do that, and it will expose them, right? It will expose the darkness, which is why, you know, we, we, we talked about this, I think, in, in here before about what that looks like to, to be at work and people to know you, the, you know, the conscience of the group and everybody saying, I'm sorry, um, and that kind of stuff. Well, it does. It exposes darkness. Um, he says that's, that's how we're to be. And he tells you why. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. So this is, again, another place of reproving. We talked before about the, um, you know, let no unwholesome work or talk come out of your mouth. Well, here, um, yeah, believers can sometimes feel safer talking about evil things if they're not doing them, um, kind of making light of them or whatever it may be. And just think, be, be careful with your, your words here as well, that this is, we're not to gloat in things for which Christ died. Um, so be, be mindful of that as well. 
Verse 13, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything becomes visible, uh, anything that, that becomes visible is light. That's just, yeah, turn on the light if you see stuff. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, where does it say that? Therefore, it says. So this is something that Paul assumes the Ephesians know. Um, normally when he does that, it's quoting the Old Testament, right? Which may be, uh, there may be allusions here in Isaiah 26, 19, 51, 17, 52, 1, and 61. There's a lot of 60, verse 1. There's a lot of awake, oh, sleeper language. So that's there. Um, some, some people, uh, some scholars think that this is referring to an early Christian hymn or a phrase or a kind of a common known saying among believers in the first century. Um, uncertain, but it, what we do know is it can be certain that this, this group would have known what this is. Um, and here it makes it into, into to, to scripture. So awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So this is a call for, um, for believers to come forth, to, to rise from the dead, um, and to walk with Christ and allow his light to shine on you and in you and from you. And this is what it means to, yeah, to walk as children of the light. You have been made alive, now walk in that newness of life. Any questions about what it means to walk in the light? Verses 7 down through 14. Anything helpful for you from that section? Anything useful? You're like, that was helpful for me. I need to hear that. Yeah. That's a great, great question. Um, I do think um, I've found in, in my life, uh, so I've had seasons where scripture memory is better than, than others. I find when I'm memorizing scripture, it's incredible how much those scriptures are, because if you're memorizing like a book of the Bible, you're going to be having it on your mind all the time. You're going to be meditating on a section, trying to think of, trying to, trying to get it, you're going to have to cards or your phone or you're going to have you know um while you're driving whatever it may be um and um i've found that 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 continual playing you know having that playlist of the word going because you're trying to memorize it is really helpful you'll just start to see all kinds of things i mean like, like ooh, I'm, I'm memorizing james it's like you know what i see james in everything right now which makes sense because it's on your mind which, by the way, just side note, that's why it's sometimes really unhelpful if you're fighting a particular sin to talk about that sin all the time. Being like, you know, I'm really, really struggling with, really struggling with, with envy because I'm always thinking about other people, what they have, like that car and their house and their, that thing and that thing that they have. And that, that really, that bothers me because all you're thinking about is that. <laughs> so, um, but in the other opposite direction is if you're thinking about God's word and you're seeking, Lord, what does this look like right now? So I think scripture memory is, is a helpful thing. Um, um, yeah, and I think kind of any, any you know, derivation of that is just, I think the more that you are in the word, the more that it is going to be in you, right? So I do think there's, you know, so for instance, for me, the way it, it works is uh, 
Like, so this week I'm, we're preaching, uh, we're going through Revelation 21, 1 through 8. So on usually either Sunday afternoon or Monday morning, I'll get out that text and I'll read it and I'll watch for things kind of all week long to think about what does this look like in these situations? So how does the, the eighth verse gives a bunch of sins, particularly the first one's cowardliness. So I've been thinking a lot about like, how's cowardliness showing up in my life? Um, or, you know, the hope of the new heaven and the new earth where tears will be wiped away. And I'm just thinking, what are the things that are making everybody cry this week that people want to be, yeah, can't wait for a new heaven and a new earth so they won't cry over that anymore. So that for me is helpful, just walking in the word and, I'm not sure what that looks like for everybody. But that's what it Anything else here? Yo. No, it's not. Well, we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a that's a great question, and this is that is that's not a dumb question. So great question. Um, so yeah, verse fourteen. Anything that becomes visible is light. I'd have to I'd have to to meditate on it more. My my impulse is the idea as he connects it with the following verse. Oftentimes, like, what does that mean? Read the next verse. Um, I, I'm going to assume it's connected with repentance. So what's happening with light? Light is exposing deeds of darkness, right? And what should be happening is turning from that. The Well, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. So it's all that call to, to come out from the darkness, out from the deadness. So I I wonder if what he's saying is, um, as the light is shining and exposing, um, yeah, anything that's exposed by the light becomes visible. Anything that's visible, yeah, it's light. I'm, I'm unsure, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume it's somehow connected with, with repentance, um, because of what follows it. That's good. Uh, I'll look up. See if anybody else has come up with anything. See, that was a great question. Anybody else have a question that I can't answer? I'm sure you do. All right, next section. Um, chapter 5, verse 15 through 6 9. Ooh, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, we're here going to be called to walk in wisdom. And the way that this text is arranged is he's going to give three contrasts, three commands, and then three contexts. Okay. I think you'll see what I mean here in just a moment. He's going to give us three contrasts, right? So don't do this, but do this. Don't do this, but do this. Don't do this, but do this. And then he's going to give you three commands. And then he's going to give you three contexts in which the final of those commands is fleshed out. Okay? So let's dive in. I think you'll see what I mean. Somebody read for us verses 15 down through 21. This will take us through the three contrasts, the three commands. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord in your life. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Great. All right, verse uh, verse fifteen. Let's begin here with these three contrasts. 
So first of all, verse 15, look carefully then how you walk. So we've got another walk here, and we're going to call this walk in wisdom. Um, and our first contrast is, is what there in verse 15 and 16? Yeah. Walk not as unwise, but as wise, right? So not walk not as unwise, but as wise. So there's a way to walk, to live, that is unwise. And there's a way to walk or to live that is, that is wise. And he clarifies here uh, specifically what he means in verse 16, making the best use of the time, or I think the NASB says redeeming the time. Is that right? King Jimmy says redeeming the time. There he is. Was, that's right. I knew there was somebody out there who had that. Making the best use of, of the time. Uh, because the days are evil. So let's back into this. The days in which we live are evil, which has been clear throughout the book of Ephesians. That's why everybody's sons of disobedience and children of wrath. That's why there's darkness, right? So there's the days are evil. You don't have to look far to see that the days in which we live are evil. The world in which we live is evil. And time here is, it's highlighted as a way to walk in wisdom. Make the best use of the time. This comes back to that conversation we had a moment ago about stewardship. Time is life's most invaluable limited resource time is life's most invaluable limited resource those three seconds of silence we don't get back the 45 minutes that you've been in here 50 minutes now it was either invested or it was, it was always invested in something, either in things that are fleeting and foolish in light of the fact that we live in a evil day. But there's a, there's an old hymn that we tried to sing here a couple of times, but if you're from CHBC, you probably sing more. Uh, it's called the sands of time are sinking. Um, which is kind of a heavy song. It's kind of it's kind of heavy, but it's uh, you should read the words of that. It's true. It's uh, we don't live in a day an age where hourglasses are used much, but it's the idea that if you turn over the hourglass in your life, and the sands of time are sinking through it, and you don't you don't get them back. They don't get back up into the top part. They drain down, and every moment that we have is it's precious you, you don't get it back um so the call here is to be wise to be wise with the days that the lord has for you now some of you might be thinking oh wow well i've sure wasted a whole lot i'm a failure it's over and i quit well stop that um and say okay well it sounds like then the lord in his providence has given this verse this time to awaken you to say, oh, wow, okay, Lord, what can I learn then? Or how can you, um, book of Joel, um, restore the years that the swarming locust has eaten? Like we have a God who can, um, <laughs> yeah, can redeem time and lives. And there's so much time that I feel like I wasted in foolishness, even as a believer. Well, especially as a believer in some seasons to where I can see though how the Lord actually uses those things in tremendous ways and so I would just encourage you to not be deceived to think that this is something that should just indict you to just feel guilty about and just be like oh, I've wasted my life or this or that well no if you're here right now this means the Lord is not done and it's a call for us from here on to to see things in light of, of eternity to, to be wise, to walk in the commands of the Lord, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord, walking in that way rather than walking in a way that is unthoughtful 
and wasting of time. I mean, think about it though. If this is true, um, how busy is Satan with trying to find ways to get us to waste time? I mean, there's a website called board.com. I don't know whether you should go to it or not. Uh, so just don't. Uh, but anytime you think, oh, should I go to the website? The answer is probably no. Um, so, but but the, the fact that there's a website called board.com means that nobody understands this verse. Like the last thing a Christian should be is, is bored. Like there's, there's so many, I mean, every moment, even in your rest, doesn't mean that your rest should be filled with stuff to do, but it means that like in your rest, you can sit and stare at the ocean for an hour and say, Lord, you're amazing. Like so much of your word talks about what's going on right now. That in the book of Job, you said, you just tell that, you tell that wave to stop right there. And it does. It just stops right there. You made promises to Abraham that said that the glory is going to be filled with as many believers as on the, on the sand of the seashore. That's amazing. These birds that are flying around, your word says that you feed them. So like that's not wasted time. So re relaxing and resting is not wasted time. Right? I just want to say that for those of you who feel like that means I always need to be doing something, um, which is how I'm wired. And I've had to retrain that. You'll, you'll hurt yourself that way and burn out. But the idea here is to be thoughtful about everything in light of what God's word says. To be wise, not unwise. This is why Psalm 90 says, so teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Psalm 90 is written by Moses, who, um, yeah, his long... One of the things we forget about Moses is that he did a lot of funerals and he buried a lot of people. He was an undertaker and he saw a lot of people die. And what he saw in that is he thought, wow, we should number our days so that at the end we can present to God a heart of wisdom. I, I tried to number my days, to be thoughtful about that they were fleeting and try to use them for you. So that's your first contrast, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is your second contrast. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So it is foolish to not concern yourself with God and what he is doing and what pleases him. Um, but rather, understand what the will of the Lord is. And Amy, I thought you helpfully brought up that this is not just, you know, God, you know, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? Like, that's a big question. and One that I think everybody in here has asked. But what the Lord would say is, good question, pray, seek my face, but do what's in front of you. Be kind to that person. Be tenderhearted toward that person. Be forgiving. Serve that person. Be generous. Be encouraging. Like, do those things, and you'll wind up exactly where God wants you. Um, but the idea here, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then thirdly, um, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So, don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, wasteful, reckless, that kind of idea. Um, but be filled with the Spirit. This is an issue of control. So think about this for a second. Um, don't get drunk with wine. What is what is drunkenness? I'm sorry, what? Okay, so it, yeah, it is foolishness to get there, and you'll do some foolishness while you're there. Good. What'd you say? A lack of control. Yes, it's a lack of control, but think we even have this. We have a DUI as a what? Under the influence. You're under the influence. You are influenced by alcohol. Why is it dangerous to drive while under the influence? You're impaired, and you're going to. Because you're not going to 
do what you would normally do. Well, some of y'all, some of y'all maybe shouldn't drive at all. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you, when you drink too much alcohol, when you are drunk, you you don't think like you should would naturally think. You don't act like you would normally act. You don't say what you would normally say. You don't even sing what you would normally sing. I've seen some karaoke where people would not be doing that had they not been drinking. Yeah, you know, I mean, like there's like all of that. The idea is do not be influenced and controlled by a substance that is going to lead you to do things, say, saying things that you shouldn't do that are going to be marked by foolishness, debauchery, that's going to be sinning. Uh, we're not going to ask for testimony time this morning, but for those of you who um, yeah, have that kind of history um, in, your, in your past, you can you can certainly think of tons of regretful things, which you should not meditate on right now, um, that you you wouldn't have done had you not drank as much. Like we've, we've seen that, right? That's, that's evidence in, in life. He contrasts that with, with being what? Filled with the Spirit. So don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Because if you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to be led to do things, say things, sing things that you would not naturally do. There's going to be supernatural life come out of you that is going to produce fruit and life and everything, which is where he goes within the three commands. Look, because if you're filled with the spirit, you're going to be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart. You're going to sing to the Lord together. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're gonna you're gonna sing about the Lord. This, by the way, is one of the things that I can kind of gauge my temperature in how things are going with the Lord. Is if in my spare time I'm singing, I've found that when I'm not singing to the Lord, it's usually because my heart's not filled with thoughtfulness about Him and joy. Um, I'll let you guys sort through that application, but. Um, singing or verse 20 so you so you're going to not naturally be singing about god and his glory and about holiness we're going to sing songs about blood really well if you feel the spirit you're going to understand why that's glorious all right not only that are you going to sing things you would normally sing but you're going to also have a posture verse 20 of give thanks always and for everything to god the father in the name of the lord jesus christ that's not natural it's natural to grumble and complain about everything you don't have. But here, if you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to be giving thanks to God always for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. We're going to be thankful. And then we're also going to, verse 21, su submit to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. And again, notice here, Obedience motivated by honoring Jesus. It's a very Godward sort of motivation. All right, so the idea here is we have these three contrasts. Don't be unwise, but be wise. Don't be foolish, but understand God's will. Don't get drunk with wine. Be controlled with it because that's going to produce unnatural, ungodly things. But rather, be filled with the Spirit, which is going to produce supernatural things. What sorts of things? Well, let me command you what to do, which you're going to find great joy in because it's pleasing to the Lord. Well, sing to the Lord together, give thanks in everything, and submit to one another. The first two, okay, make tons of sense. Well, what does it mean to submit to one another? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm now going to give you three contrast, three contexts in which... Uh, we're going to discuss what submission looks like. We're going to do that in the home with a wife to the husband. We're going to do that in the home in another place with children to parents. And then we're going to do that with slaves and masters. So he's going to give us three contexts in which submission is played out. What does it look like? Well, here you go. So that will work on Thursday. Lord willing. But for now, up through verse 21, 15 through 21. Anybody have any questions about these three contrasts or these three commands before we...
next Thursday before Thursday, we get into the three contexts of wives and husbands, children, parents. It's good. Yeah, making the most of, of opportunity. So we want to not engage in their sinful works of darkness, but rather we want to relate to unbelievers in a way that's thoughtful, being discerned. By the way, that framework of the three contrasts, three commands, three contexts, I got from Bodhi Balkum a number of years ago, and I thought it would be really helpful for me in clarifying what's going on in this, this section. But any other questions, though, about these? Or anything in particular that, uh, yeah, was helpful for you? Any, any things you're like, I needed to hear that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk away and think more about this today. Uh, or anything that we've gone over today? No, no. Um, that in ancient times the pagan would use alcohol to induce certain so great questions. Yeah, so so certainly alcohol and uh, uh, and, and drugs, Greek word pharmakeia, it shows up as one of the, the fruit of the, the spirits where we get the word pharmacy from. So um, one of the fruits of the flesh is is to not engage in drunkenness and pharmakeia, which is again the uh, other chemicals, drugs, because it it takes you out of your normal control and it it's often associated with immorality. So yes, in most sort of um, worship of Many, many false gods, not all do this, uh, but many of the false gods, it will be incited by, by drunkenness. So. Yep. Yeah. In regards to be filled with the spirit, I, when I've heard people teach it, it's usually emphasizing that it's passive things, which is a, in a passive sense. But what are the ways? Is there any practicality to that? Total practicality. So the, the, the verb, be filled with the Spirit, is a passive thing, which doesn't mean you don't do anything. It's an active, you actively be filled with the Spirit. Again, I think the illustration of, a, of the sail is, is, for me, the most helpful, that you're in a boat and you put up the sail to be caught by the wind and pushed along. So in the same way, practically, we want to obey. We see Scripture. How do I be filled with the Spirit? Lord, help me to do this. In this instance, Lord, help me not lie. Lord, help me to tell the truth. Lord, help me to encourage. Help me to so obey both by abstaining from things and engaging in things that the Lord commands. All of that is how you are filled with the Spirit. So being filled with the Spirit is not just waking up and being like, Lord, have your way in me and whatever that means. I'm ready. Go. Like, it just doesn't work like that. That's just not how it works. Now, you can totally surrender the Lord with your hands up all you want. Praise God. But you, it's going to go from there into, Lord, what are the things you've given me to do today and to walk in that? So. Uh, I'm just benefited from 15 to 21, just thinking about how I can better pray for my own sanctification for my brothers and sisters in Christ, just so I can love them better through prayer. <laughs> like you were saying earlier, how you think in terms of just something as they interact with I think it's really helpful and freeing. You're like, so all of this the Lord commands, the Lord also supplies grace to do. So that's good. Yeah, I like this the thankfulness part. I'm thankful for so much and and enjoy practicing looking at all the blessings God gives. But then there are those things like the eternal well-being of the people you love. And It doesn't feel like I have a thankful heart because I can't let go of that stuff. Sure. 
Yeah, so I would say in something like that, I think you can thank the Lord. Lord, thank you for helping me to be grieved. Thank you for helping me to, to feel what, in a sense, you feel. The Lord does not delight in the death of the wicked, right? He desires all to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. So, yeah, so I think we, we can know that in the same way, I think the fact that you even, it makes sense. It makes sense you're going to care about a loved one generally. Like I don't want them to get COVID, right? But to say, yeah, I don't want them to get COVID, but then I, I want them to not be eternally separated from God. Like that's not natural to think like that. So I just want to encourage you. The, I think the, one of the ways you can be thankful in that is, Lord, thank you that you've helped me to feel soberly and rightly about things that matter eternally. And Lord, I pray you change their heart. And if they're still alive, then you can thank the Lord that, that he's still spared them to this point and plead with him to change their heart. And then plead with them to change their heart. That's good. And see, thank you for sharing that because that was a fresh rebuke for me to be not ready for the election to be over. Uh, as much as I have been in recent days, but to just be like, you know, Lord, this is obviously just where we are today. So I'll thank you for that. I'll, I'll, I'll receive that from you. Uh, so. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything else? Well, thank you guys and gals for this. Yeah, this time it's always it's good for me to get in the word with y'all. Uh, you have good insights and I appreciate hey, your desire to, to learn from the Lord. So let's ask him for for grace as we go, I'll pray for us. Father, we do thank you for your word, and we pray that you would help us to walk in the light. That you would help us to not yeah, be partners with darkness. But we pray if there's any relationships that, as we hear that, we think that need to be altered. Or would you give us courage to trust you and to, to get some help from a friend, to, a friend who loves you, to yeah, live out what might be a tough obedience. Father, but we pray that we would all be discerning what is pleasing to you and that that would be our greatest thing, that Christ, who was shamed for us, um, yeah, loved us and that we would be moved to that yeah, desire to, to honor him. We also pray that you would help us to, to walk, um, not as unwise, but as wise. Or would you help us to be good stewards of the time, be uh, yeah, discerning what your will is through your word and be filled with the spirit, not drunk with, whether it be wine, whatever else, Lord, that we could be drunk on that the world offers. And would you fill us with your spirit in such a way that we would give thanks and sing unto you. Lord, might you today even fill our hearts with a song uh, about you? Would, you? would you move us to do that? And Lord, for those of us who feel like that would be very hard to even know what to sing, Lord, would you give, give grace and help us? Lord, we're weak and we're frail. Lord, we need you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yo. You want to sing the doxology? All right. Jen's been asking to do this. Uh, and I just can't sing. And we're on video. You've got to turn this video off for if I'm going to sing out loud. So, uh, sorry, y'all.